Okay, this is Dr. Morton. Um, going to talk about the uh, um, going to talk a little bit about stepper motors, and also going to talk about uh, a color sensor. Um, so hopefully, uh, be able to cover that. This probably won't be a very long video uh, because it uh, probably won't take me too much time. But uh, maybe on Thursday, I'll uh, uh, set up the stepper motor and maybe also a servo motor, and I'll kind of run both of them. Um, so this is. You know, this is a pretty, uh, the topic has a pretty large dimensionality. I mean, you can you can go all the way from big industrial um, servos and big industrial steppers uh, that are used on assembly lines or in robotic welders. And these are, these can be super powerful devices. Um, the kind of stuff we're going to deal with is more of the hobby stuff uh, or smaller uh, stepper motors in in the hobby world, um, our servos are not super precise, uh, and they're not all that. Uh, they don't have all that much torque. Whereas uh, even reasonably sm small stepper motors are a lot more powerful than our servos, and they're a lot more precise. So in the hobby world, uh, for things like um, you know consumer three D printers and things like that, stepper motors are are, are more much more commonly used than um, than servo motors would be. Um, and uh, and there's several parts to that. Uh, typically, stepper motors uh, are are limited to a rotation angle of 180 degrees. At least most of the hobby stuff is. Uh, obviously, industrial things could be much more complicated than that. Whereas stepper motors can take as many steps in one direction as you want, and then you can take as many steps in the other direction as you want, and you can you can go round and round many times as long as you keep track of how many steps you've taken, you can always get back to where you were. Uh, one of the big differences between steppers and servos is that servos have a shaft encoder that always tells a servo where where the where the shaft is oriented. And a stepper on the other end doesn't really have that. So a stepper takes very precise steps, but it doesn't necessarily know where it's starting. And so generally you do have to have some sort of um, external mechanism to determine the starting point. So if you've ever watched a 3D printer, usually the first thing it does when you turn it on, it, it finds out, it runs the, uh, the three axes up against stops uh, where you have limit switches, and those limit switches then tell, the, tell that stepper motor for each axis, okay, you're, you're at zero. And then the stepper knows that it has to count in the other direction. And as long as it doesn't uh, have a step that gets... Uh, skipped, it'll be fine. And okay, so uh, let's look at the syllabus real quickly, like we always do. So, um, so uh, here we are on the uh, tenth. So we're supposed to talk about uh, uh, color sensor and stepper motor. So I'm going to talk about. I'm, I was. Sp I was going to demo them, but I really didn't get that set up. It's a little more. Com I, it's going to take a little setting up, so I'll do that. Um, okay, and then I do want you to. Uh, uh, so f you should have all your labs done by now, but uh, but basically we're coming up on the last day to make up labs. I think I had it listed on the thirteenth, but I'll probably extend that. Uh, but if you do not have if you don't have all your labs done, uh, you need to get cracking on them. And you need to uh, either show them to the TA in person, or you need to send the TA a video so he can give you credit for them. And don't don't let that go forever. You need to get that done. Uh, it's Like I said, it's set for the 13th, uh, which is... Uh, yeah, what, uh, sorry, let me put that back up. So, uh, yeah, we had it set on, well, that would be Friday. But what I'd like you to do instead, um, we'll make it the following Friday. So it'll be the 20th. Uh, so that'll be it. After the 20th, you're done. That's the last lab anyway. So, um, so if you don't have all your labs done by the 20th, you can miss one. You'll lose some points for that. If you have two labs not done, you're not getting a grade in the course. You're going to get an incomplete. 
So I'll, I'll modify the syllabus and repost it. The 20th, the, the, basically the Friday uh, before, uh, the week before Thanksgiving. That's it. You must have all your labs done by then. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So if, if you're missing two labs on Saturday, the 21st, you're getting an incomplete. Don't even ask. That's just how it's going to be. And you'll have a year to make it up. If you don't make it up, you get an F. It rotates to an F. You don't have to pay tuition again, but you have to do the work, show me the work, and then I'll change your grade from an incomplete to whatever you would have gotten. I'll give you credit for it. You maybe get a B, maybe get an A. Uh, but if you don't, if you don't complete the work within a year, then you get an F. So, and and you you cannot do it until the start of the next semester. So, um, so maybe early January. You can tech, you can email me if that you're in that situation, which hopefully nobody will be. No excuse for it. Everybody's got the opportunity. Uh, there are about 20 people, 21 people in fact, who did not pick up their LCD, or who didn't have one mailed to them. So if you're one of those 21, I, I don't know how you're going to do that lab. But I mean, I guess you can borrow one that somebody else has. That's fine. But you need to do it yourself. You can't borrow their code. Uh, you need you need to do it yourself. And uh, do a, shoot your own video with your ID in the video. So so let's get the labs done. This is where you this is the meat of the course. This is how you learn to program a microprocessor. And you need to really you know, you need to give it a, a full-blooded effort. Just, you know, copying somebody else's code and not learning a thing, that's a really bad idea. Don't do that. Learn what you need to learn so you can finish this course and say, okay, I can program, I, I have a good working knowledge of sort of a basic level of programming a microprocessor. And then you need to kick in on your, make sure you've submitted your, your, your proposal for your project and make sure then you're working on it because you don't have any more labs to do. You should have them all done. So you should be using uh, several hours every Friday to work on your project and, and some other time too. And uh, you know it really shouldn't take you more than about maybe 10, 15 hours tops. If you're having a lot of trouble, uh, I had intended to schedule some help sessions. Uh, I was gonna do one last week, but I didn't, uh, Friday, uh, I didn't get home until after, um, after when I was going to have it, so that was part of the problem. But uh, I really want you to get, uh, you know, we'll, 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 I will give some help sessions on Zoom, and you can come and you can you can uh, have your integrated development environment. We can open it up, um, and uh, I can help you debug your code. So make sure make sure you're working. If you need uh, some special parts, let me know. Uh, well, they, I have them at school, so if you come in on. You can always come in on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday as well. Monday and Wednesday at 2, Tuesday at 11.30. So I'll be there tomorrow at 11.30 for probably an hour or so. I'll be in I'm in there every Monday and every Wednesday at 2. I'll be in next be in Wednesday at 2. And then I'm there Friday from 10 to about 12. So just come in and get some help. Uh, get some parts. Get some, you know, if you can't think of what to do for your project, come in and we'll talk about it. I did give several ideas about Simon Says and CypherLock. Those are two easy ones to do. They're fine. They count. And there's plenty of other ones. Uh, uh, you know, uh, having uh, setting it up the, the temperature sensor, displaying that on the LCD, and then using the uh, using the pot to set a threshold where it uh, turns on an LED when it crosses a certain temperature range. That's fine. Uh, you could even have it set up so it would would uh, so you could uh, have a little incubator. And you could have a little styrofoam oven with a light bulb in it, and your temperature sensor. And uh, whenever uh, the temperature uh, gets above a certain range, the light bulb goes off. When it drops below a certain point, the light bulb comes back on, and that will generate enough heat inside a small little styrofoam uh, enclosure, like a styrofoam cup or something, that uh, that you can have that be a little incubator. And you could get a fertilized egg and stick it in there and have a chicken. <laughs> so. Uh, do something like that, and you could display on the LCD the, the what the temperature is, and you could uh, you could track it so that uh, so that it it uh, keeps a little graph of uh, the last you know of the last 24 hours or something. All sorts of great things you can do. Uh, there's really the sky is the limit, and I have a bunch of stuff. So um, you know if you want to do a GPS and try and read that, that's fine. If you want to try and 
interface uh, and you know a nine axis IMU that's fine just just get started on something that's the key uh, when you screw around and don't get started and then you know you got a week to do it that's not enough time you need more than you need time to try and write some code and then if you find out you're struggling with something you need to get some help and we'll give it to you we, we're you know I'm I, that's really I, that's what I do right that's that's I enjoy that and I'm pretty smart so I can help you uh, and uh, we'll we'll get it done. Doesn't you know? It may take so there. Sometimes it takes a little more than other times, but one way or the other, we'll figure it out and get it done. So get the help you need if you need it. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, servos. So I'm gonna I'm gonna switch this and and um and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the the color sensor. That's you might want to use the color sensor. Um, okay, sorry, didn't take in. Okay, so here we have servos. Uh, so servos, especially little hobby servos, are really quite nice. Let me here. I'll do this and shrink it down more. Okay. So here's how a servo generally looks. I don't know why this is kind of screwed up. Um, I'm gonna can you see that really? Let's go back. All right, so so a servo is made up of these parts. Now, there are there there's actually a whole range of th of servos. There are uh, industrial servos servos that run on uh, three phase AC uh, th with very powerful motors. There's there are DC industrial servos, and some of these have uh, have have a, a servo controller, a servo amplifier, and then the actual servo. Uh, and they have uh, very sophisticated uh, 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 sensors to sense the position of the shaft. And most of them do have gearboxes. Uh, the, uh, so there's a motor. In the case of our little uh, hobby servos, these are always DC motors. Um, and they, they're typically brushed. Uh, so the motor uh, the motor runs pretty fast, so that's why you have to have a gearbox to slow it way down so the shaft's only turning a little bit uh, very fairly slowly. And, uh, and then hooked to the shaft is usually a potentiometer. And as the shaft rotates, it changes the, the position of the potentiometer. And the potentiometer then is what tells the, the, the control circuitry, which is this air amplifier, uh, where, where the shaft is. And then it compares the position of the shaft with this control pulse that's converted into a into a positional voltage and this air amp then compares the position that's being set by your by your control signal from the microprocessor and by the way that control signal is a PWM signal it is always PWM for these hobby servos with uh, it compares that uh, so the PWM signal goes into this pulse width the voltage converter and then that comes out and is sent to the air amp. And then the position sensor sends a voltage that's proportional to position. And then it compares. And if the position is exactly uh, what the control pulse uh, is requesting, then the air amp will send no signal to the motor. But if it's uh, a little one way or the other, then it'll run the motor forwards or backwards through the gearbox, and it'll change the shaft, which will change the position sensor, and eventually null out the air. And that's that's how that works. So it's sort of a it is a little control system, uh, but that but the control here is not in software. It's it's all built into the little servo body itself. Um, so that's the that's servo. And I'll I'll demonstrate that on Thursday. I'll set that up and demo a little servo. The code for it on our chip is really really easy. Um, and um, it yeah. All right, and then. Um, Let's see yeah so then we have um, then we have uh, another pictorial the same kind of thing I don't know we don't really need this one I guess so the control signal for the servo for hobby servos is is very standard uh, now for big industrial servos it's, it's totally different but for hobby servos the control signal they want is is a is usually a three and a half three point three to five volt signal, and it and the servo all the servos they look like this they have a, they have three wires ground, 
uh, motor power and control signal. The control signal and the motor power share a common ground, but the motor power is usually six to six and a half volts. Whereas the control signal can be 3.3, it can be uh, probably even 1.8, and it can certainly be five volts or so. But, uh, but it, it shouldn't be much over five, it shouldn't be over five volts. And the control signal is a PWM signal. Now what's interesting is this PWM signal is, uh, uh, has a period, a pulse period of 20 milliseconds. And of that po pulse period, the the only uh, part that's really meaningful is, uh, is from one to two milliseconds. Now in reality, it's a little less than one and it's a little more than two. Uh, but it's in that range of, of, uh, of say 0.7 to one for for full uh, counterclockwise and uh, maybe 1.7 to maybe 2.2 to be full clockwise. Sorry, full counterclockwise. Let's see, let me pull it down here. So the rest of the, so, so only the first uh, two milliseconds or maybe 2.2 milliseconds of your PWM signal is meaningful if if you have and that would be because your pulse period is 20 milliseconds right so a two millisecond pulse would be a 10 percent duty cycle and a one and a one millisecond pulse would be a uh, five percent duty cycle so the only meaningful change in duty cycle is from five percent to ten percent anything under five is usually just still full clockwise. Anything over 10 is usually full counterclockwise, with the exception that it might go up to 2.2 or something milliseconds. So maybe 11, 11% 11 from maybe 4% to 11%, say, because these hobby servos are not, not as precise as you'd like them to be. And they usually, to get that full 180 degrees rotation, you usually have to exceed the, uh, uh, you know, the, the normal one to two millisecond uh, range. So, uh, so we, so what's interesting then about this is, we have to have a very, very, we have to use a, a maximum. Uh, 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 we have to use the maximum clock period. So we have to, we have to let the clock run all the way to FF because it's an eight-bit clock that controls our our PWM modules on this pick, and and we can't really run the processor any faster than four megahertz. That's absolute max. If we run it faster than that. You, you really won't be able to get this period long enough. Even with running at four megahertz, about the maximum period you can get is 16 milliseconds. So it's a little less than 20. It turns out that works, okay, works out okay. In fact, for most um, hobby servos, you can, you can trim this period down even maybe to 10 milliseconds, maybe even eight or nine milliseconds. Uh, and it'll still work fine because again, the only part that you're changing is from one to two milliseconds. Which, if you trim it down to ten milliseconds, now you're now you're going from uh, ten percent to twenty percent, which actually gives you a better granularity in in how precisely you can control the angle of the servo than if you have a twenty millisecond period with still just uh, uh, ten bits of resolution. Uh, Okay, so there, there are several features that you, that you should think about. One is the output voltage of your PWM signal. And it turns out that output voltage is established by the voltage you're running your, your microprocessor chip at. Now you could obviously, uh, you could drive your two transistor switch with your PWM signal and send out a much higher voltage, but servos don't want to see a high voltage for their control signal. They want to they wanna see TTL level, so that's five volts or less. So, but if you were doing something else, then 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 uh, besides maybe a servo, then this then the voltage you could you might want to change the voltage that your microprocessor is running at. But basically, uh, this PWM does not work by varying the output voltage. That's usually a fixed quantity. And if you want to run at higher voltages, then you use an H bridge or you use uh, a FET and a separate power supply to achieve that. You don't drive it directly then from the microprocessor pin. Um, 
But in the case of servo, you can drive their controls. The control line can be driven directly from the microprocessor, so that's nice. And five volts is fine. The serv the actual motor voltage though should be about six volts, six and a half, no more than that. And if you try and run it at seven volts, you you can easily burn a servo up. Uh, we burned a whole bunch of them up uh, in micro two because uh, we were using seven point two volt batteries and. Um, in the cup car, there was a one ohm 20 watt resistor that was in the circuit to try and drop the voltage a little bit, but uh, sometimes that doesn't work quite right. We burned up some of those too, as a matter of fact. And then in the tilt tables, we didn't we put in a separate one ohm resistor, and uh, we burned up a lot of servos with the tilt table. So uh, so we've changed that out, and now we have a voltage controller uh, that can handle uh, the amperage for the servos, and uh, we run them at six six and a half volts maximum and it doesn't we don't burn them out now uh, at least much more rarely all right so so notice here so this this would be full counterclockwise this would be full clockwise and at 1.5 millisecond pulse width here in your 20 millisecond pulse period so that would be a duty cycle of seven and a half percent that that seven and a half percent duty cycle with a 20 millisecond pulse period gives you uh, the neutral position so the servo should be centered at that at that signal and and you'll see most of the time these servos jitter around they're they um they are they are not you know you can well if, unless you spend a lot of money on the hobby servo maybe like 50 or 60 bucks if you just buy one for three or four bucks like we usually do uh, they're, they're not a fine piece of equipment. They kind of jitter. Some of them don't work quite right. Um, so, uh, but of course, if you buy an industrial servo, that's a, you know, a, a three-phase AC uh, servo, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's going to be a very expensive piece of equipment, thousands of dollars probably, including, including a controller and amplifier. And you're going to spend, uh, you know, you're going to spend pretty good money, but then you're going to have a very, very... Uh, precise piece of equipment that's got a lot of torque and can be positioned uh, very accurately to specific angles. So uh, sometimes servos are made, uh, they they basically take out the potentiometer and what you do, your signal then determines whether it rotates uh, clockwise or counterclockwise in a continuous fashion. It just keeps going round and round and round and, uh, and, and you can vary the speed by uh, how far from one, the 1 1.5 millisecond neutral position your signal is. So if you're down here at, uh, at, at say, 0.7 to 1 milliseconds, you know, the say, 5% duty cycle, well, it's going to go fast in the clockwise direction. If you're at, uh, you know, 2.0 to 2.1 milliseconds, it's going to go really fast in the counterclockwise uh, direction. So... Uh, so you can so it's very nice you can control the speed and often these are used uh, to drive the wheels on robots all right and here's what some of them look like you can see some of these are big industrial pieces of equipment some of them are even linear actuators they have they have sort of a ball screw and they'll move this uh, they'll move this actuator back and forth on this uh, shaft uh, instead of having a, a, a shaft that rotates it's gonna it's this is going to slide back and forth on this on this, uh, it's essentially a screw, uh, and it and it turns and moves it back and forth. Here's what a hobby servo looks like. There's a little bitty servo. This is the kind of thing you might put in a uh, in a model airplane. Of course, you might put one of these too, but usually they go for the really small ones. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so there there. More, more recently, hobby servos now come in a digital variety, and uh, and these are definitely pricier, but they're much more accurate. Uh, and now, instead of an analog signal that's a PWM signal, you actually can give it a digital signal. Uh, I mean, you, certainly the PWM signal is kind of a digital signal, but it, uh, we think of that as sort of analog control. Um, whereas you can actually give it a you know uh, you know eight bits or something. To, to set the uh, the controller. And uh, with the digital servo, you can set endpoints, you can set rates of change and n number of other settings, and you get a lot finer control over the servo position. Um, 
Okay, so... Yeah, so I, I'll just mention this. This is a terrible drawing. I, it's hard for me to even look at it. It makes sense. But, but basically, you can have a servo where the pulses all begin. Uh, they're all high at the beginning of your pulse period, and then they stay high for whatever percentage of duty time you set the, the duty cycle at, and then they drop to low. And then the next, they go high again and stay high for the percentage duty cycle and drop low. And maybe if the duty cycle is zero, they, maybe they never go high, really, if it's zero. And if it's 100%, they stay high the whole thing. But, but mostly, you're going to have something le greater than a zero and less than 100%. And so what happens is then this, this on pulse is, is aligned to the left edge of your pulse window. Now, it turns out, as you change this duty cycle, when it's edge aligned like this, it generates more spurious radiation. So if you put it on a, on a, um, if you put it on a, uh, uh, on a spectrum analyzer, you would see there are a lot more uh, side lobes uh, generated, uh, and these side lobes can, can be noisy. Now in a 20, milli, 20 millisecond pulse, uh, you know, that's only 50 hertz, so that's, <coughs> that's pretty low frequency stuff. So that's, that's going to be noisy, spiky, but it's not going to be horrible. Uh, and, and, uh, but when you're driving uh, H-bridges, and the H-bridges can get kind of crazy, and, and in the H-bridges, they're switching pretty high voltages, potentially. They might be, well, they might be switching, uh, you know, 400 volts DC or something. Um, I think my uh, pick-and-place machine has servos that run at 70 volts DC, and, and they're generating some noise. And one of the things that happens is in a, not in our pick, but in a, in a more slightly fancier pick, um, our other microprocessors, their PWM module can, can have what's called a center aligned pulse. So as you change the pulse, it never, it, unless it's 100%, it doesn't start at the beginning of the pulse window. It's, it's, it keeps that pulse, however, whatever the percent duty cycle it is, centered in, in the window. And the advantage of that is that it's uh, it generates it as you change the width of the the as you change the duty cycle. It actually generates a little bit less uh, frequency noise than it does if you have it edge aligned. So a, a more sophisticated PWM module will allow center center aligning, and and you should generally use it. Uh, all else being equal, you normally want to go with that if it's available. Uh, it's not on our chip, so it's no big deal. Um, and so, um, yeah. So the control registers that are involved with PWM, there's a there's a period register that's associated with, well, first of all, you, you have to select timer 2, 4, or 6 with the TCON register. And, and, uh, and you can, you, you do have three different timers, two and four and six, and, uh, but you have four PWM channels. So you, so generally you probably run all the channels on the same timer. They could have, they can obviously have different duty cycles because that's all individual, but they could even have different periods because you can change the PRX register. Normally to get the maximum granularity of control of, uh, of how fine you can control the, the duty cycle, you would want to have the PRX register set to FF so that the counter is going to count all the way up to fully all its eight bits and then then it'll roll over. But you could shorten that a little bit uh, and it's not going to kill your resolution totally. Uh, and you could have different periods so you could have some that would be operating at different periods obviously. Or you can use a different timer. Uh, that's also an option because you do have three but you wouldn't be able to have a separate timer for all four. So some of them would typically use the same timer. And a lot of times you use the same timer for any PWM, you know, for all four channels if that's what you're doing. Then you put the duty cycle in the CCPR XL register. So if there's, if it's channel one, that's X is one. If it's channel four, X is four, so forth. And then you have the CCP con X register, CCP X con register to, uh, to uh, set some of the other features. Now, it, there are other registers available with, uh, with the enhanced uh, 
the PWM channel one and two, they, they have some extra registers. And those extra registers are if you want to th the pick to, to actually be your uh, your actual H bridge, uh, the pick can actually work as a as a four output H bridge, or it can work as a two out two output half H bridge with the uh, PWM channel two. Uh, so those two enhanced channels give you some H bridge capability. Um, Normally, though, it's probably smarter and uh, just a better idea to go ahead and buy a separate H-bridge and use that. But you don't have to. You could. You can actually generate uh, the H-bridge with the pick, but you still probably can't drive the motor directly from the PWM pins uh, because they can only source 20 milliamps. Most motors are going to pull a lot more than that. And the motor's in big reactive load, and that's going to send a lot of noise back into the microprocessor and probably screw things up completely. Um, so you definitely you definitely don't want to drive the motors directly. You really can't. Uh, so even if you don't have an external H bridge, you're going to have to have external uh, switching elements, which would either be BJTs uh, for small current devices or FETs if you're ha if you're drawing you know several amps. Uh, so or you could even use uh, solid state relays if you're driving a lot of amperage. You could even drive an, an AC operation that way. But one of the one of the things is the uh, the H bridge circuitry on the picks just not super sophisticated, and um, normally normally the, you have a little bit of dead band when you run an H bridge, which means when you switch when you switch the the, the direction, um, you you usually are you usually have a you don't you 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 completely turn off one set of switches before you turn on the other set because you you don't want any time at all where where uh, switches on uh, that would connect both of the the you know the the high voltage power for the motor to ground uh, even for an instant even for maybe a, you know a fraction of a millisecond that still could have a big uh, current spike and and that would do uh, could potentially cause a lot of heating and damage and and the pick doesn't really have a dead band set up uh, again a fancier PWM module does have dead band built in but our pick doesn't have that so you probably unless you're doing really really low power stuff you probably don't ever want to use the pick uh, the actual built-in uh, H bridge capabilities of the pick all right so those registers aren't even listed but there's some uh, there's a bunch of different registers that do uh, you know they call it, it's called PWM steering and a bunch of stuff and how you can set up the H bridges uh, the H bridge functionality all right so that pretty well covers uh, covers that. I did want to say, uh, so let's see how we're doing on time. Uh, so about 33. I, I may, um, so maybe I'll maybe I'll talk about SPI just a little bit because we really haven't we really haven't done that. Uh, let me see if I can do this. So so we'll do the SPI. So um, so we've talked about. UART, we've talked about um, I squared C. Those are two of the serial protocols and USB. Um, we really haven't talked much about USB. USB is fairly complicated, and now the USB C is 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 very complicated. So that's way beyond the scope of this course. Uh, but certainly, those are the most popular protocols, and I think you're going to see eventually soon in the next oh in the next few years. Uh, Everything is going to be USB-C, um, and uh, that's going to be really nice because USB-C has just lots of built-in capability and options, and and it's a very very nice protocol. Uh, but it is it is complicated, and uh, when you plug in a sophisticated USB device, first of all, it's got it's got it's got integrated circuits built into the actual plug itself. It, the plug is reversible. You can plug it in right side up or upside down, but it turns out those are entirely different connections as far as the actual hardware is concerned. And so then the hardware has to go through this complicated handshake to uh, straighten it all out. So even though for you, you think, well, it doesn't matter how I plug it in. Well, no, it doesn't, but but it does make a big difference in reality. It's just that the the uh, the electronics built into the, to the USB-C uh, standard sorts it all out for you so it appears transparent but when you first plug it in there can be um, 
there can be many as many as 25, 35, 40 different uh, handshaking uh, exchanges of information that go on uh, between the, the two devices and even the cable. The cable's got its own smarts and, and uh, it's just amazing. So, so believe me, um, USB-C is complicated, but in its complication, it is extremely powerful. And I think we're going to see everything go USB-C. Um, and the nice thing is, I think I mentioned this before, but it can supply um, uh, quite a lot of voltage. Let me let me do this real quick. I'll, I'll just just uh, let's see USB-C. So so um, if you look at the Wikipedia, this fairly isn't the best one. Uh, let's see. So. Let's see if it's got a, yeah, so here are the wires in, involved in USB-C. Um, so there's A, B, so there's, so there's a ground, there's a super speed differential pair, there, uh, uh, P, there's a super, super speed differential pair N uh, for negative, so positive and negative. There's a bus power, there's a configuration channel, this is where the messages are transmitted back and forth. There's a... Uh, 2.0 differential pair position 1, 2.0 differential pair position 1 negative. Then there's the sideband use. There's the bus power. Uh, there's the super speed differential pair number 4, Rx negative, and super speed differential pair number 4, Rx positive, and another ground return. So you can see, so these are pair 1 and 4, these are pair 2 and 3. And um, believe me, it's complicated. And here's what it looks like. So there's there's quite a quite a few conductors and some of them have shields uh, here's the two in the middle are D, D minus D plus D plus D minus like this um, and so these two do get plugged in either way when you flip it around and those are the standard original US two, USB 2.0 but uh, and then there's grounds on either end so those are actually symmetric too but all the rest of this is not symmetric and it has to be it has to be negotiated uh, and uh, and it has to be uh, arranged. And I think, let's see if it talks about the power involved. Uh, let's see, cables, connectors. So it's a 24-pin double-sided connector. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bigger than the US, than the mini, than the micros. It looks, it kind of looks a little bit like a, uh, looks a little bit like, it's close, it looks similar to like the, the Apple uh, Lightning type plug. Let's see if it uh, defines the power here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, here's the cable wiring. You can see, uh, see, look at all the shielded. There's one, two, three, four shielded pairs in the in the cable. Uh, a couple of unshielded twisted pairs. There's all sorts of crazy stuff, and uh, and some of the conductors are pretty good size because, um, let's see. Uh, okay, um, this may not, uh, let's see, doesn't, uh, and it can go up to 40 gigab gigabits per second, so very fast. Uh, okay, does it talk about here? Um, There, there, oh, man. So, yeah, here it talks about power. So this mode, so five volts at, at a half an amp. That's the standard USB. But uh, see if I can find this. Sorry. So here you have uh, so five volts at up to nine hundred milliamps, and then. A USB mode can be entered where 5 volts at 1.5 amps or 3 amps is provided. And then there is a much higher voltage. Uh, let's see if we can find that. 20 volts at 5 amps. So USB-C can go all the way up to 20 volts at 5 amps. That is, that's a lot of power, folks. And, uh, and of course, this has to be negotiated. You don't want that just to be turned on willy-nilly. Uh, so it, you have to you have to you have to have you have to talk 
to the device that's going to supply that power and convince it that you're uh, prepared to, to receive it and everything's configured correctly before it turns it on. But yeah, you can get 20 volts at 5 amps. Uh, pretty amazing. All right. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, I wanted to do that. All right, so let's go back here. We'll get rid of this. Okay, so SPI. So uh, so SPI is is kind of the 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 fourth protocol we really want to talk about. So USB, UART, I squared C, SPI. Now besides that, there are a whole bunch of other ones. Um, there's an SM bus protocol that's basically a derivative of I squared C that's used to control. It's you, what it's basically mostly used for is when you punch the, the, the button to turn on your laptop or your desktop, you're actually communicating over an SM bus, which is kind of like an I squared C, but that's 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 how that that's where it's usually used most. So SPI has been around for a good long time. It's a synchronous serial protocol. And uh, devices operate in master or slave mode. There can only be one master. And for all practical purposes, uh, you're normally only talking to one slave at a time. Uh, but there are there are some ways you can do some other things. And normally for every slave you want to add, you have to add another slave select line. The uh, all of the all the buses in the SBI protocol are 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 go in only one direction. The master controls all the buses except for the master in, slave out. And and these names are really nice. Mosey for master out, slave in. Miso for master in, slave out. But unfortunately, I guess these maybe are are trademarked or something. So a lot of, a lot of manufacturers shy away from using them, even though they're really helpful. Because if you have something labeled Mosey, you can always connect Moseys to Moseys and Misos to Misos. But if you have something, if you have something, if you have serial, serial data in, serial data out, that then it gets confusing. Um, and your serial data out normally has to connect to a serial data in, and vice versa. But MOSI connect to MOSI, MISO connects to MISO, as long as you are not trying to connect two masters together, which generally won't work. So the master control. So there's. So here are the four lines that make up a standard SPI connection. MOSI, which is master out, slave in. MISO, which is master in, slave out. SCK, which is serial clock. Now in the I squared C world, we, we don't call our I squared C clock SCK. We call it SCL. Kind of interesting. And if they use the other terminology, it's SDI for serial, uh, well, SDI for serial data in for MISO and SDO for serial data out. For MOSI, that's on the master side. On the slave side, it's the opposite, other way around. Um, so you might see SDI, SDO, SCK, and SS. Uh, those are the other ways of labeling it. Uh, but in in I squared C, the two lines for I squared C are always SCL for the clock and SDA for the data. <coughs> so that SDA should not be confused with SDI and SDO. Okay, I know you think I'm smoking something now. All right, the slave select, well, this, okay, the serial clock. The master sends out the serial clock, and the clock can be really fast. It can be in the megahertz range. Uh, there are limits, but it, but generally SPI will run very fast. Um, and then you have what's called the slave select line. Now, if you only have one slave, then you might as well just leave the slave select line permanently tied uh, active, which is generally active low. It's always active low. So when you want to select a slave, you take its slave select line low. And when that line goes low, then the slave is turned on and it's now driving, it's now driving MISO. The slave outline is being driven by the slave. The master outline is being driven by the master and the clock line is being driven by the master and the slave select line is being driven by the master. But the, but the MISO line is always driven by the slave, and the master just receives it. Now, the way SPI works is, for the most part, you always send eight bits both directions. So, MOSI sends eight bits out of the master into the slave, 
and miso, eight bits come out of the slave and into the master. And they usually use two shift registers, one at each end, and they shift the bits out of one and into the other, and out of the other into the one, so that the bits, the two registers, uh, after eight shifts, have exchanged information. And they do it on the serial clock pulse. Now, uh, and the slave select, usually uh, it has to be active for this transfer to occur. And usually there's a period of time before the transfer starts that you must have the slave select good, and it has to be good for a little bit after the transfer. And um, so that can be a little bit tricky. Um, so the, so compared to I squared C in UART, there, there's double the number of lines just for a single slave. And then as soon as you put on more slaves, you normally are adding additional slave select lines. Obviously, you can't have two slaves trying to drive the MISO line at the same time because they'll conflict. So that's why you have to only activate one slave at a time, unless you use some other arrangements you'll see in a minute. All right. So, uh, so we normally just have a shift register on the master side, shift register on the slave side, and they exchange eight bits typically. Um, sometimes they'll do, do more, but usually it's an eight-bit transfer. And there are all sorts of devices that use SPI, and I, I'm not going to talk about any particular one. There, I've got some examples, but I don't think I'll go through them just in the interest of time. But uh, but typically, the SBI data transfer is initiated by the master. A master is responsible for generating the clock signal to synchronize the data transfer. And the data transfer is always considered bidirectional or duplex. It happens simultaneously. So these are the kind of things you can shift registers, LED, LCD drivers. This is really classic, like two line by 16 displays and other stuff. Although I've never, you see a lot of two line by 16 displays with the I squared C interface, you don't see too many with an SPI interface. Uh, phase lock loop chips, memory components that have SPI interfaces, ROMs with SPI interfaces, A to D and D to A converter chips are very commonly used this way, and a bunch of other chips. A lot of chips are used with SPI. Uh, most of the chip to chip connections are SPI and I squared C, almost all of them, unless there's some one of the other weird protocols. Okay, the problem with SPI is that there's there's four modes, uh, and you have to be in the right mode or it won't work, and the modes don't have the same uh, nomenclature from data sheet to data sheet. Uh, somebody will call mode zero different than somebody else's mode zero, and mode one might not be mode one for somebody else. It might be mode three or four or whatever. So it gets kind of confusing. So the modes depend on uh, whether the clock idles high or idles low, and whether or not the data is exchanged on the falling edge or the rising edge uh, of the clock. So those are the two different modes uh, based on those two different uh, two different uh, those on those two different uh, uh, decisions. It's, you can really think of it as two bits. One bit is whether the clock idles high or low, and the other bit is whether it's leading edge or falling edge. And so because of that. Uh, uh, because of those four different modes, you've got to you've got to figure out what the right mode is, and and it turns out it can be difficult to do that. Uh, you've really got to dig into the data sheet and look at the timing diagrams to figure it out. Because again, when it says mode zero, that may be the same as another mode zero, and it may not be. Okay, if you want to have multiple slaves, this the the standard way is just to have additional slave select lines. But now you're burning up extra extra ports on or extra pins on, on your microprocessor so so people have gotten work around methods uh, this would be the classic well in this one you don't even have a slave select line you just permanently ground the slave uh, and then you can save that slave select pin and use it for something else potentially miso coming from the slave into the master master in slave out mosi master out slave in and the clock line coming from the master so the clock line ticks, tick, tick, tick. Every tick, the, the shift register in the slave sends a bit to the shift register in the master, and the shift register in the master sends a bit to the shift register in the slave. And usually it, it changes at least eight bits. There may be some, maybe sometimes they'll set up for more, but typically it's an eight-bit shift. Certainly in our chip, it's eight bits. Now, if you want to have three slaves, you, then you have three slave select lines. 
like here is one slave select line, here's the other, and here's the other. Now, unlike here, where you ground the slave select line, if you ground the slave select line here, then all three of these slaves will be trying to drive MISO at the same time because they're not going to let that line float. It's not like an open collector with pull-ups. It is a driven line. It's either a 1 or a 0 all the time when the slave is selected. When the slave is deselected, then that line would float. But when the slave is selected, that line is driven high or low all the time. All right. So if you want to get away from having to have a unique slave select lines for all your slaves, you can daisy chain them. So you can have uh, the mosi can come in here and the miso can go out to this mosi and this miso can go out to this mosi and so forth and you can have a bunch of them daisy chained. Now the only thing is it, it slows down transfer rates. If you want to send something say to slave 1 you have to shift it 8 times into slave 0 and then you have to shift 8 more times into slave 1. And then when you want to read something from slave 1 you have to shift it however many additional slaves you have here till you finally shift it into the master and you have to keep track of that so it's a little more overhead to keep your signal straight but it's but it definitely can save you slave select lines and here they can all be grounded because this this driven line goes straight to this input and this driven line straight to this input and this driven line back to the microprocessor so they are driven all the time but they're not driving the same line um, so that's one way it can be done, but it does complicate the software a little bit. So it's not as clean as uh, doing the individual slave connections with individual slave selects. So uh, here's a chip. This is a this is a uh, uh, this just has a eight bit eight bit. It's got an eight bit latch, so you can put eight bits out, or you can read eight bits in, and it's driven with an SPI interface. Um, you can use this to drive seven segment displays although you usually have to have uh, uh, if you're driving more than one segment you usually have to have uh, uh, BJTs or, or FETs to handle the extra current all right uh, I'm not going to go through I don't think I'm going to talk a whole lot here's a here's a TC72 digital thermometer that's driven by a that's connected by SPI um, and you can see how it tra how it it's got uh, four uh, four internal registers, and um, so you can you can address them and then you can write them individually. The temperature comes out actually is 16 bits, and the, the control register can set things like um, I don't know Fahrenheit maybe uh, versus centigrade. Uh, I don't know uh, how how long it's integrating each temperature. All right, and I guess here they, it's it's 10 bit. Yeah, it's 10 bit two two's complement word. Anyway, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, I think that's really all. You know, so you can do you can certainly do a D to A. Here's a D to A converter. These are these are typically if you wanted to interface a real high speed D to A converter to your microprocessor because you wanted to crunch some audio, then. Uh, then this would be one way to do it, would be to use this external chip. It's dual channel. And uh, and the micro is fast enough to, to read the bytes in, but it's not fast enough to do the DDA to get good resolution on audio. So you, you would use an external uh, DDA converter that was pretty fast, uh, but you but not so fast that you couldn't read the data coming out of it. Because remember, the, d the data coming out of it, uh, going to the micro, uh, has already been converted, so you're just reading in bits. Not you're not going from a voltage level through a DDA conversion step. All right, I think I'm going to quit with that. Um, all right, so uh, I did want to say just a little something about the temperature sensor, and I think I have that. I think I have a a, a data sheet on that pulled up here, and hopefully here. Yeah. So here's what it, here's what it looks like. I have one here, which I'll. Sh show you. Let me switch this out. And I, I'll fire it up. Uh, I'll try and demonstrate it on uh, uh, what they do with it. Mm. Ah! 
Well, let me show you my. I'll show you one of the stepper motors. Oh, man, I had that out too. Okay, here's that. Oh, here's this. Okay. All right. So, so here's the, here's here's the stepper motor. So you can see it's it's pretty good size. It's nice and heavy, and and when you turn the crank, you can feel the little teeny steps, because uh, there's a little permanent magnet in there as part of the rotor. And then here's the color sensor. It's got it's got four uh, white LEDs on it to provide illumination and then there's a little sensing chip right there and it's very it's it's a very cool setup uh, I, I was going to also show you this is uh, this is what the stepper motor controller looks like it it does have it's got a bunch of pins it's got a heat sink here let's see uh, maybe we'll let me do this we'll change the brightness so you can see it So you can see it's got a bunch of pins. I think there's eight pins on each side. Uh, four pins, four pins go to the actual um, uh, stepper motor, and they they all use very standard plugs. These these they they have this um, six pin plug, but they only use four of the pins, and uh, it just plugs in like that, and that's all it takes. And actually, if you spin the shaft, you can generate power because <laughs> it becomes a generator if you want to use it that way. Uh, Okay, well, I won't worry about that later. All right, so back to the color sensor. So that's what it looks like, and that's about how big it is. And it's got it's got eight pins to interface it. So a lot of lot of pins to account for. Okay, let me sw switch this back. Okay, so here I am. All right, so so basically, um, there's the chip, and uh, usually you have to put something over it to kind of keep out the room room glare and stuff. But these little sensors are great because uh, if you put over a little shield and then you put right on top of that what you want to sense, then the uh, these will light it up so the uh, little sensor can see it. it can run from 2.7 to 5 volts. Here's what the chip looks like, and I, I think they have, uh, maybe they have a little picture of it. I don't know. Uh, no, they don't. Let's see if they show one. Um, I don't know if this, I don't know if this will have it. Yeah, what you can see, it's not a, not a really good picture. I don't know if they have that. Yeah, I don't think it's going to have no so if you look at it carefully, I, I don't I don't think I can show I don't, I don't I don't know if you can see it. I'm, I'll put this camera way down here. We'll see if we can maybe see it. When it's really magnified, you can see it. Let's um let's do that real quick. Sorry. Okay, and then we'll, we'll see if we can focus. Now, I don't know if you can see it or not. Maybe not. It's probably not going to happen. Let's see if it will focus. Oh, maybe. Almost. Let me see if I can adjust this, get the brightness to... No, I don't know. Guess it's not going to work. Well, if you could see this, what you'd see is that there there's an 8x8 eight by 8, uh, eight, by eight uh, sort of miniature set of sensors and so there's 64 sensors and uh, so you divide that uh, 16 are totally clear and then 16 have a red lens 16 have a blue lens and 16 have a green lens on them and so that gives you four different channels clear and RBG 
And so that's how that's how you read the color. You scan all four channels, and what it does that's a, kind of interesting and a little surprising, it it actually encodes the intensity of of all of the 16 say 16 red ones. It'll encode that intensity when you and you choose uh, you choose which ones you're looking at by uh, the sense lines S3 and S2. Uh, S0 and S1 determine uh, uh, what your frequency range is. But what it does, it, it takes the, 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 the illumination level falling on each of those squares through their color filter. So in the case of the 16 red ones, they, they all are filtering out uh, everything but red. Uh, and so they're measuring the intensity of the red. And, uh, and so you set S3 and S2 to read the, the red channel. And then once it's read the red channel, then, uh, uh, then you uh, then you shift it to read uh, the blue and then the green, and it actually uh, let's see uh, let me go back to this one. So it actually here's how you do. Uh, if they're both low, you get red. Low high, you get blue. High low is clear, and high high is green. And then the other two control lines uh, do the frequency scaling, and uh, at at 100 percent they're they're running at pretty high frequency um, so for most microprocessors we, you're going to run at about 20 percent what you have to do in your microprocessor is you actually have to do a uh, a, uh, a a frequency to voltage uh, scaling so you have to count pulses over a fixed time interval just like you do for touch sensing and uh, and then you have to convert the number of pulses you counted uh, you know, into a numeric value, uh, so you don't really do a, you don't really do a pulse to voltage conversion. You you do a, you you generate a digital number out of it, and uh, it's kind of a, it's not really a, it's kind of an arbitrary number depending on what your counting interval is. But uh, you want a long enough counting interval that you can get a good good resolution, um, depending on how fast you want your results. If you want to sense the color very quickly, then you're gonna you're gonna count fewer times. Um, and it's really cool to look at it on the oscilloscope. I'll try and demonstrate that on when, on Thursday. I'll, I'll try and show that. And you can see as the microprocessor switches between channels, the frequency for any given um, color that it's sensing changes for each channel. And it's it's kind of an interesting look on the oscilloscope because you see it switching real quick back and forth between uh, uh, different frequency square waves. It puts out a square wave at a, at a frequency that's proportional to the to the intensity of the light falling on the selected uh, RGB or clear sensor, and of course that's 16 of them, so it averages those 16 together. So that's how it works, which is pretty cool, and uh, and it you can scan it really fast. Um, uh, in the in the little skittle sorter that I built, I I I'm not scanning it very fast. I'm I'm probably using I don't know maybe uh, maybe almost a quarter of a second for each channel. So I mean it might maybe even half a second for each channel. So it's almost a two second scan, which is really long. I've seen some examples where they drop it through a they drop it through a uh, a plastic pipe and the sensor is mounted in the middle of the pipe and as the skittle falls past the sensor, it senses all three colors, pretty reliably. Uh, so. You know, so clearly you can do it really fast, um, but you do need to count some number of pulses so you get, you know, you have some some sensitivity. All right, well that's pretty much all I wanted to cover today, um, <clears throat> and hopefully then, um, hopefully this uh, gives you a little bit of a little bit of an idea of of uh, the color sensor, a little bit of idea of servos, a little bit of idea of steppers. Um, I will talk a little bit. I'll try and demonstrate the stepper, the servo, and the color sensor on Thursday. Uh, hopefully. If I don't do it this week, I'll do it next week. Uh, all right. Um, so again, finish your labs, get started on your project, uh, get everything, get your homework done, get everything turned in. Actually, it's too late on the homework, I think. But try and uh, turn in your, your uh, turn in sheets for each lab. But remember, what when I say you have to complete all but one of the labs, I'm, n I'm not talking about the turn in sheets. I'm talking about demoing it to the TA or sending the TA a video with your ID card in the video showing that you did the lab and it ran on your board and worked. 
If your board's having trouble, please see me because you got to do it. You got to use it for your project. So uh, come in and bring your board with you, or give me an email. Um, I did have one student email me his board. Um, I had one student with a really crazy air. Uh, maybe I'll show it to you. It's the most amazing thing ever. Uh, but uh, I was proud of myself for figuring it out because it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. It, it wasn't obvious. That's for darn sure. And the, what happened was his, his uh, RB7 button was kind of only working irregularly. And I'll show you what happened. It's kind of really interesting. So here's, here is the, uh, here's the board. Now, as you know, um, the, uh, the push button uh, header is right here. And here's Here's a, this connects to the button, this connects to RB7, and there's there's a pull-up resistor here and a capacitor here. The pull-up resistor is 100K, so it doesn't add much drag to the RB7. But the, uh, uh, and the cap just helps filter out any noise from the switch and whatnot. So there's a tracing that runs from here all the way over to here, which is the RB7 pin, which is this one right here. And, uh, and so if you flip over the board, so this is going to be on the top now. So here is our RB7 pin. And if I angle it just right, you can see maybe. It's really hard to see. But you can see that this pin runs right between these two, uh, these two uh, uh, terminals here. And what happened when he soldered in his, his 2x10 pin header, he scratched some of the solder mask off of this tracing, and he splattered. He he bridged a little solder bridge from this pin to this tracing, which meant effectively that this pin, which is if we count one, two, three, four, five, okay, so one, two, three, four, five. So I think it was RC two, but maybe it was RC one. I think it was RC two. So effectively, RC two was connected hard connected to rb7 which meant when you were when you had the blue led on or no i'm sorry the green led on um yeah no uh, it would be ra2 well hell i don't know so maybe it was uh well i don't know i guess it was rc2 uh or rc1 but anyway when when we had rc1 low it then it 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 meant it was as though you were pushing the button all the time now, if you had RC1 floating, the button would work fine. And so, of course, all we had to do was suck the solder off and then solder it back, being very careful not to bridge it to the little scraped off spot there. So that's one reason why you kind of got to be a little bit careful and not too rough with your soldering iron onto the, onto the printed circuit board. Because if you really scrape, you can flick a little bit of solder mask off. And, uh, and then, you can, then you've got copper, which uh, you can definitely solder to accidentally. All right, so um, okay, so that'll do it. Uh, so again, just be working on all your stuff. Uh, I I do not. I I told one of my students today, I'm not interested in your failure. I'm interested in you succeeding. Uh, so it pisses me off when you fail. And the only reason you're ever going to fail one of my courses is because you didn't do the work. If you're struggling and having trouble, you're not going to fail. Okay. And I'm going to help you. So no excuse for, no excuse for screwing this up. So get, get working on your project. All right. We'll see you then later.